A final word on the sentencing for Lori Vallow. The Gilgo Beach suspect Rex Hewerman appears in court. When there is a dead body, the general rule is that somebody has to go to prison. Alex Murdoch's personal banker is sentenced for his complicity. Nicholas Rossi is coming to America. A death row inmate's final words before his execution. And then finally, our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. Good day, everyone. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. Thanks for joining us. You know the drill. Subscribe if you haven't. Like if you do. Leave me a comment. Hit that bell. And remember, you can listen to us on any of your favorite podcasting apps. All right, let's go ahead and open the docket for August 2nd, 2023. And first, let's begin with a final word on Lori Vallow. Yes, the sentencing was Monday. I know it is Wednesday. Now, we had a great live show last night, and we discussed the Lori Vallow sentencing. And we were fortunate enough to have uh, Larry and Kay Woodcock uh, join us uh, briefly. And, and Kay sent us a very nice email today. And they are truly the heroes of the Lori Vallow Chad Day Bell case because I truly believe if it was not for them pushing authorities to locate their grandson, JJ, well, Lori and Chad may have gotten away with it. Anyway, what I'd mentioned as it relates to the Lori Vallow sentencing is I was very surprised is that the defense didn't do anything as it related to all of her mental health issues. It was very odd to me. In fact, all of their pleadings had said, it's all going to be about mental health, mental health, mental health uh, during all their pretrial filings. Remember, the prosecution was saying, you can't talk about mental health. And they're like, we're not going to talk about it at trial. We're going to talk about it at sentencing. And I thought it was very odd. And I mentioned that the other day. And I also mentioned it last night that there was an order that came out, but I didn't have it with me. But I went back and reviewed it again today and just to make sure I wasn't losing my mind. So the court ordered that it wasn't going to consider the objections to the pre-sentence investigation report that the uh, defense had filed. And they were basically saying, hey, you need to consider all of the previous competency evaluations that have been considered. The court said, no, you didn't do it properly. You never asked for any post-conviction evaluations to be done on Lori Vallow. And Lori Vallow, whether she refused to give you consent or the defense attorneys never received it or asked for it from Lori Vallow. So they, the court then by law could not consider the previous evaluations that had been given to the court. As you may recall, Judge Boy said, I know you have mental health issues, read all that information, but it didn't go into it. And he obviously sentenced him. He sentenced Lori Vallow straight to prison because, well, he couldn't have sent her to a state hospital because either she didn't give consent or the defense attorneys didn't do their job. Now, the court did note that the objection wasn't filed until two days prior to the uh, sentencing, which was obviously on Monday. So it came in on uh, Friday afternoon. The government issued a response on the weekend or over the weekend for the court to consider, and the judge ruled on it. I can't imagine Lori Vallow's attorneys were so busy with other matters that they couldn't have handled a sentencing for the biggest case of their entire career. Just another, just another issue that uh, may raise its ugly head on any sort of appeal or post-conviction matter. We'll see how that turns out. Next, the Gilgo Beach case. Yes, the accused Gilgo Beach serial killer, Rex Hureman, appeared in a Long Island courtroom yesterday. He didn't speak during the proceedings. He was allowed to wear a uh, blue shirt and a black suit jacket paired with some khaki pants with grenade pockets on the side and his handcuffs obviously around his wrists. Now, Mr. Hureman is charged with the murder and the deaths of three women whose bodies were found dumped along the Gilgo Beach in December of 2010. Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Lynn Costello. He is also the prime suspect in the death of a fourth woman, Maureen Brainerd Barnes. Now, Mr. Hureman, an architect from Massapequa Park, was arrested on July 13th outside his Midtown Manhattan office and is being held in the Suffolk County Jail without bail. Now, Mr. Hureman's wife, Asa Elsrup, 
who had said she was shocked by his arrest and has since filed for divorce, was not one of the uh, people in the audience attending his court proceedings. Now, police said that they found a walk-in vault in the basement and removed nearly 300 weapons from Mr. Heuerman's home when they searched it, but have not found anything of any significance um, that's been recovered as it relates to the homicide. Now, Mr. Heuerman's wife and his uh, and her two children, Christopher Sheridan and Victoria Heuerman, returned home last week after police concluded their search only to find it in a shambles, according to her. Now, most people don't realize that when the police get done searching a house, um, as in this case, it would entail every nook and cranny of the house because they're looking for anything that could be hidden, so they're gonna tear it apart, yet the police don't have to put it back where they found it. Yes, their, their, their mothers never taught them that um, you need to leave the area cleaner uh, when you leave it than the way you found it. No, that's not the way it works when they when they do that. So ultimately, a GoFundMe page has been set up to raise money for Mr. Heuerman's wife and her two adult children. And as of Tuesday, the campaign has raised more than $13,000 towards their donation goal of $25,000. That's something you don't see every day. An alleged serial killer's wife needs a GoFundMe page. And her adult children? I think that's a first. Let me know if I'm wrong. Anyway, the defense attorney for Mr. Hume and a guy by the name of Michael Brown urged the public not to judge his client prematurely. He says that the press has convicted his client without seeing a shred of evidence. And so he doesn't stand a chance with the press, although he did speak with them. And he also noted that we are not going to try this case in the press. We're going to defend this case in a courtroom where we have 12 fair and impartial jurors, where we have a fair and impartial judge. Mr. Heuerman stated that when he's gonna fight this in a courtroom, he says, where words like presumption of innocence and beyond a reasonable doubt, where words like that reign every day, that's where we're going to try this case. It sounded like Mr. Heuerman's attorney was giving his closing statement. Anyway, Mr. Heuerman is due back in court on September 27th. All right, yes, as a general rule, when there's a dead body, Guess what? Somebody has to go to prison. Just a general rule. And I bring that up because do you remember Jamie Lee Komorski? That's right. She's the 25-year-old woman accused of killing a newlywed bride and injuring the groom when she drunkenly, allegedly plowed her speeding car into their golf cart on their wedding day. Yeah, Ms. Komorski will remain behind bars awaiting trial as she faces charges for reckless vehicular homicide and three counts of driving under the influence causing death or great bodily injury. Now, Ms. Komorski appeared in court via video yesterday and um, she was visibly distraught and uncomfortable as the court denied her appeal to have a bond. So Ms. Komorski's attorneys requested that a $100,000 bond under the condition that she attend rehabilitation programs, remain under the uh, mother's supervision, and forgo access to a vehicle or alcohol. The defense argued that she didn't pose a community danger or flight risk and emph emphasized her lack of prior criminal history and her strong family support, all what you put in a typical bond argument. But without bond, Ms. Komorski has been housed at the Charleston County Detention Center since April of this year. Now, the 25-year-old was three times over the legal limit when she killed Samantha Hutchinson in uh, Folly Beach, South Carolina. Hutchinson and her new husband, Eric, were being ferried from their wedding reception in a golf cart. Komorski's blood alcohol content was 0.261, three times the legal limit on the night of April 28th, and reportedly told the police officers, all of a sudden something hit me. I did nothing wrong. While driving a rented Toyota Camry, Ms. Komorski was driving about 65 miles an hour in a 25 mile per hour zone along a poorly lit residential street around 10 p.m. Ms. Komorski then allegedly rear-ended a golf cart carrying the bride and groom causing it to be thrown some 100 yards and flip over several times, killing Miss Hutchinson and seriously injuring her new husband. So let's get real here, ladies and gentlemen. Miss Komorski needs to get used to her new reality. The reality is that she is going to prison. Yes, she's getting credit for the time that she is held pre-trial, so she needs to consider that. 
her attorneys need to go and present as much mitigation they can to limit her exposure at trial. She needs to get real. Somebody needs to give her a reality check and say, this is not a probation case. You killed somebody because you were drunk that you probably wouldn't have done unless you were drunk. And the other person is seriously injured with a traumatic brain injury. You're going to prison. So let's get real. Give me a number. That's what the attorneys should be asking. The number being, how many years can you authorize me to go and say you'll accept if they'll offer a plea bargain? That's what happens. She's going to prison. Now, let's face it also, it's a DUI case gone bad. Unless there's some issue with the blood test, nothing to indicate that, that anything we've seen, uh, there's nothing bad as it relates to some sort of illegal conduct by the police. Of course, they had reason to contact Ms. Komorski. There was an accident. Come to reality and start working on that plea agreement. Next on the docket, Russell Lafitte faces his sentencing. Russell Lafitte, you know, Alex Murdoch's personal banker, well, he'll be spending the next seven years of his life in prison. Last year, Lafitte was found guilty of six counts of financial fraud. Lafitte was sentenced to one more year than he would have if he had pled guilty. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the trial tax under the federal sentencing guidelines. You don't get the acceptance of responsibility adjustment when they do the federal sentencing calculations. And therefore, yes, it is a trial tax for exercising your right to make the prosecution prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. Anyway, the judge recommended sending Mr. Lafitte to the Federal Correctional Institute, a.k.a. FCI Jessup in Georgia. Now, in what Richard Gurgle called the greatest modern scandal in South Carolina history, Lafitte's seven-year sentence was not sufficient but not greater than necessary to achieve the principles of sentencing, standard language in every federal sentencing. The judge noted that the hope is that it will serve as a deterrent for anyone else who had attempted such a crime. So two federal courtrooms there in South Carolina were filled. And I'm telling you, let me tell you this sidetrack here. I did a case a couple years ago in Charleston, there at the federal court. The most beautiful, amazing courthouses I have ever been in. If you get an opportunity, go there. There's a new part, and then there's the old part. If you ask politely, they'll let you go to the old part and let you in. Usually the marshals will escort you around and show you around. Amazing, beautiful, worth the stop, okay? Little sidetrack. So there were two federal courtrooms that were full of spectators for the sentencing. In the crowd, obviously, were friends and family of the ex-banker, including John Marvin Murdoch, who at times openly cried as he sat near the victims. Um, Mr. Lafitte turned to face his fraud victims, which included Hakeem Pickney's family and the Plyler sisters to apologize. The victim said they forgave him, but they can't forget what he did to them. Meanwhile, Mr. Lafitte begged for mercy from the court, but the judge made it clear that this was an apology coming far too late. Judge Gurgle also took time to describe Lafitte as an incredibly cruel for the conspiracy he concocted with Alex Murdoch to harm such vulnerable people. Judge Gurgel said he heard a lot about the good deeds that Mr. Lafitte had done, but there was an elaborate criminal scheme here. There was not just bad judgment. This was complicity. So Mr. Lafitte off to prison, seven years. As you may recall, he tried to have his verdict vacated because Alec Murdoch said he had nothing to do with it. He did. It didn't get sent back. We'll see how any appeals turn out. Maybe that Alec Murdoch saga is coming to an end. Next, Nicholas Rossi. He's been hiding out. Well, guess what? He is coming to America. Now, Nicholas Rossi has been branded as dishonest and deceitful as he is evasive and manipulative by um, the sheriff is wanted by authorities in Utah for allegedly sexually assaulting a woman back in 2008. He also faces accusations of domestic violence. Now, the 36-year-old Nicholas Alaverdian, before changing his surname to that of his adoptive stepfather, David Rossi claimed he had been diagnosed with stage 4 non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in late 2019 and told friends that he was dying. An obituary actually appeared online for Rossi in early 2020, saying that he died and that his ashes had been scattered at sea. But the following year, he was arrested on a COVID hospital ward in Scotland, 
where he registered as Arthur Knight, an Irish orphan, which he continues to insist is his real identity, claiming to have never set foot on American soil. Well, it was later determined that the fugitive who appeared throughout his court dates in a wheelchair using an oxygen mask is indeed Mr. Rossi after he was identified through DNA and several distinctive tattoos, which were described in an Interpol alert. He has also spoken with an unconvincing accent in a notorious interview, angrily denied his name was Rossi or Alaverdian, Alaverdian, and theoretically collapsed into his wife's arms after trying to stand in a bizarre effort to prove he could not walk. Well, Rossi learned his fate at an Edinburgh sheriff's uh, court today when the sheriff, uh, Norman McFadden, ruled there is no impediment to his being extradited back to the U.S., with the Scottish ministers to make a decision within the next 28 days. Now, an application for bail was apparently lodged with the court and refused by the sheriff. Now, Rossi's legal team and the Crown deliberated on whether he should be transferred to England to face questioning over another alleged sexual assault there as well. However, it was apparently decided the matter would be dealt with following the decision to extradite him to the United States, and the Scottish minister will now review the ruling to determine whether to uh, issue an extradition order. Now, under the guise of Arthur Brown, Rossi is believed to have met his wife, Miranda Knight, in Bristol back in 2019 and married her sometime in 2020, assuming the name Arthur Knight. They then moved to Glasgow shortly afterwards, but in 2021, Rossi became so ill with COVID that he had to be hospitalized at the city's Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. And then in July of 2020, DNA allegedly linked him to a 2008 sexual assault in Utah, ultimately leading to his discovery in Scotland. He was arrested on December 13th of 2021 at the hospital by police officers who served him with an Interpol uh, notice or warrant. We'll follow that case. He's going to great lengths to come back. Most people say, fine, I'll go back. Let me get this over with. Nope. All they have to do is prove identity. Clearly, the DNA proves identity. Mr. Rossi, you're coming to America. Next, a death row inmates final confession. Johnny Johnson received a lethal injection dose at the state prison in Bone Terry and was pronounced deceased at 6.33 p.m. Central Standard Time last night. He was convicted of the July 2002 killing of Casey Williamson in St. Louis, uh, area suburb of Valley Park, and was put to death shortly after the United States Supreme Court rejected his request to block the execution over an argument that he was mentally incompetent. It's alleged that Johnson, who uh, had schizophrenia, expressed remorse in a brief written statement released by the Department of Corrections hours before he died. His note said, quote, God bless. Sorry to the people and family I hurt, period. That was the statement. Now, Johnson's final meal included a burger, curly fries, and a strawberry milkshake for that last meal. Now, as he was laying on his back with a sheet up to his neck, he turned his head to the left, appeared to listen to his spiritual visor shortly before the injection began. He then faced forward, his eyes closed, with no further physical reaction. Some of the witnesses at Johnson's execution were several members of the girl's family, the former prosecutor and police investigator who handled the case. As noted, the Supreme Court with Justice Sonia Sotomayor and two other justices dissenting rejected a late request to stay the execution, and Johnson's attorneys have said that the inmate had delusions about the devil using his death to bring about the end of the world. I guess that argument didn't work, and we're all still here. The girl's disappearance from her hometown of a Valley Park on July 26 of 2002 set off a frantic search for her, and all they found was her dead body. Now, Casey's mother had been best friends in childhood with Johnson's older sister, and it even helped to babysit him. Now, after Johnson attended a barbecue the night before the killing, Casey's family let him stay on a couch in the home where they had been sleeping. In the morning, Johnson took the girl, still in her nightgown, to an abandoned glass factory, carrying her on his shoulder to the walk for this dilapidated glass uh, factory site. When he tried to assault her of the sexual nature, Casey screamed and tried to break free. He killed her with a brick and a large rock, then washed off in a nearby river. Johnson confessed that same day to the crime, according to the police. 
It was more violent and brutal than any case he's ever seen, said the former St. Louis County homicide investigator Paul Nesky, who questioned Johnson at length the day Casey's uh, murder was investigated and he was at the execution. Now, after a search by first responders and volunteers, Casey Bodies was found in a pit buried under rocks and debris less than a mile from her home. At Johnson's trial, defense lawyers presented testimony showing their client an ex-convict who had been released from a state psychiatric facility six months before the crime had stopped taking his schizophrenia medication and was acting strangely in the days before the slain. The jury didn't buy it. Well, in June, the Missouri Supreme Court denied an appeal seeking to block the execution on the arguments that Johnson's schizophrenia prevented him from understanding the link between his crime and the punishment. The three-judge federal uh, appeals court uh, last week temporarily halted ex the execution, but the full Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals reinstated the uh, death warrant. Johnson's attorneys then filed an appeal to the United States Supreme Court regarding his competency to be executed didn't work. Governor Mike Parson on Monday denied a request to reduce Johnson's sentence to life in prison. The clemency petition was uh, by Johnson's attorney said that Casey's father, the victim's father, Ernie Williamson, opposed the death penalty. But Casey's great aunt, a woman by the name of Della Steele, wrote an emotional plea to the governor urging the execution be carried out to send the message that it's not okay to terrorize and murder children. And then finally, our dumb criminal of the day. A Mississippi man was sentenced Monday to 40 years in state prison for breaking out of a correctional facility and holding three people hostage at gunpoint. Okay, that seems to make sense. Well, the problem is he did that with just two months before he would have completed his seven year sentence. Shundrick Huffman pled guilty to two counts of kidnapping uh, before a judge, and, and the judge sentenced him to 40 years in state prison. Huffman, who escaped the Central Mississippi Correctional Facility in August, had nearly completed that seven-year sentence for aggravated assault with an expected release date in December. Investigators said that Huffman fled and broke into a nearby house, holding the homeowner and two daughters at gunpoint. He then stole one of the hostages' cars before wrecking it and running toward the nearby Mississippi State Hospital campus. He was ultimately arrested, hiding in a trash can. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, maybe somebody should talk about this guy's competency. Or maybe he's just dumb. Or I guess maybe he's just institutionalized and wanted to go back to prison. But the reality of it is, he's our dumb criminal of the day. Nobody escapes from jail when you're almost done with your sentence, only to pick up a new case and get 40 years. That's dumb. All right, thanks for watching. I appreciate you all taking the time to watch Crime Talk. Have a wonderful day, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>